Um, and then we'll hand over to uh, Robin Tate, who will facilitate the meeting. Um, so, uh, Hybrid Glanker is uh, partnering with Soil CRC and, um, uh, to deliver this workshop today. And the Soil CRC was established in 2017 to give farmers the knowledge and tools they needed to make decisions on extremely complex soil management issues. So at Holbrook Landcare, we're working with our local farmers to improve productivity um, and increase sustainability of their soil asset. Being part of the Soil CIC provides an opportunity to work with researchers from all over the country and internationally, enabling us to hear the latest information and decipher what's relevant for our farmers. Um, bridging the gap between soil scientists and farmers. Um, we'll, uh, we'll contribute to the future health um, and performance of Australian soils. So we thank um, Soil CRC for their support. And, um, and I'll hand over now to Aisha from Upper, uh, Upper Hopkins Land Management Group. Um, who we're partnering to deliver this webinar. Thanks, Aisha. No worries. Thanks, Phoebe. So I'm Asha Burdett from the Upper Hopkins Land Management Group. We're a land care group in southwest Victoria with over 100 members. Um, and we've been going for, we'll be celebrating our 30th anniversary next year. So the, the goals of the Upper Hopkins is to focus on environment, productivity and our community. And soil health has been really a big focus for the group in the last couple of decades, really. So we've been unable to do any field days lately. So we're very happy to collaborate with Phoebe at Holbrook and to present this webinar with the support from the Soil CRC. And thank you all for getting up early and joining us too. And now I'm gonna hand over to um, Robin Tate who is an agronomist living locally, and she's going to be your facilitator for the day. Thanks, Robin. Hi, Phoebe. Um, yeah, thank you, Phoebe and Asha for that introduction. So welcome everybody to today's um, webinar. I'm sure you're looking forward to as much as I am from listening from Grant and Declan, both very passionate people about soil. Um, so for today, there'll be a quick interaction from me um, and then Declan will give us all things science about soil health. Um, and then Grant will um, go move on and talk to around the practical sides of soil health and what he's doing to improve the health of his plants through improving his soil health. And it leads me to the question of the chicken and the egg, what actually comes first? Is it a healthy plant or is it actually a healthy soil or is it the other way around? So um, yeah, quick introduction to myself. You're probably wondering um, who I am. So um, I am a production agronomist from Tasmania. I've um, worked for the past 10 years growing pyrethrum, which is a daisy that produces insecticide. I've got vast um, knowledge in um, intensive cropping rotation of the Northwest coast um, of Tasmania and have very little knowledge in broadacre and um, livestock, but I'm doing my best to learn as much as I can at this point in time on a very steep learning curve. Um, so over my time as an agronomist, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I've become very disillusioned um, with the whole process um, of just treating symptoms rather than the underlying um, problem that is causing all of the issues in our plants. So I was um, wondering why like such high inputs and in our plants are still continually getting sick. Um, it led me to down the path of looking at um, soil health and how we can actually improve those, our plants by giving them, growing them in a good um, medium. It then, um, led me onto my Nuffield um, scholarship, which I was fortunate enough to travel the world in 2018, learning from absolute world leaders in um, soil health and how they're farming to, to pr improve prove their soil so that they can reduce their um, inputs that they're requiring and also um, allow the so soil to provide those ecological benefits that it can to us and make farming actually easy. 
so um, yeah, I went to uh, seven, yeah, seven different countries, learning from all of those leaders. Um, I was in the UK, through Europe, and then through America. And it was during this time that I actually became fully awoken to just how alive the soil is and how important it is that we actually treat it as a living organism. But much of our farming is, is not um, doing this. We are not thinking about the soil as a living um, living thing. We're treating it just as a medium to and a substrate to grow our plants. Um, and then, um, yeah, and so it came, I came home from that. I was very disillusioned, as I said, and I couldn't go back to traditional agronomy. So 2020, we had grand plans of leaving, leaving Tassie and expanding my world and learning about from um, world leaders in soil health and as much as I could about the practical side of farming for, um, yeah, so that I could be helping more farmers along the way change their practices and start treating our soil in the way that we should so it can support us. Except 2020 had very different plans for me. Um, I made it to Victoria and that's as far as I've got. Um, but what a fantastic year it's been learning all things um, sheep and livestock and absolutely streets away from my pyrethrum fields. I've spent all my life trying to kill clover and ryegrass. Now I absolutely want it to flourish and be absolutely healthy for, for our sheep that I'm working here on the farm at Chatsworth. Um, so yeah, but after all, we all know that soil is the common thing that brings us all together as farming, no matter what um, style of farming we're in. Our ultimate aim is to have good soil and we are growing plants to harness the um, sunlight energy so we can um, produce our final products. So a thriving soil is absolutely critical for our farming enterprise. This is a really good example of what our soil can actually do. In France, I went to a very poor region. Um, and when I say poor, I mean poor soil. It was basically like wheat, white beach sand. Most of the farmers were very high input, having to use high levels of cultivation just to be able to produce a crop. These soils were waterlogged during winter and too dry during summer and potentially um, blowing and producing very poor crops. Uh, yet going down the road just a little bit further, um, visiting Frederick Thomas has been able to um, incorporate the five principles of healthy soil into his system and produce this beautiful, rich soil full of organic matter that provides, provides all the services that a healthy soil can to his plants. His, plant, his soil is now um, holds has a higher water holding capacity, so requires no irrigation during summer. And during winter, he, um, it is not waterlogged and it is producing really productive crops, which is allowing him to actually um, buy up all his neighbours as they're leaving the district, going bankrupt in their high input um, um, system that is degrading the soil. Which is really exciting to see that it, when you actually do look after your soil, it will provide for you. Um, and then just to, um, on soil health, what my biggest awakening during my Nuffield travels around the world was that in we, we focus on soil health is a big focus on the physical, the chemical and the biological side of soil and where it interacts is actually what we term soil health. In th all of our training through university, um, in any sort of training that we've had, we actually really just focus, have focused on the physical and the chemical side of soil, yet, and a tiny little bit on biology, yet I discovered that biology is absolutely critical in soil health and creating in the physical and, the, and a lot of the chemical as, um, aspects of, of the soil. This um, slide is courtesy of Joel Williams. He proposed that actually what we should be thinking about when we're thinking about soil biology, um, sorry, soil health, we should actually have um, plants included in this circle and that be the interaction of, um, of what soil health is because it is so much 
a part of that whole soil ecosystem. Plants, after all, are the link between the above ground world and the below ground world. If we've got a healthy plant, it can be reflecting what is happening below ground and we're having a, health, a healthy soil um, ecosystem. In, in other ways, um, if we've got a sick plant, it might actually be representing that our biology and our soil need some more work. So I think that is really fitting for today's, um, today's webinar with our focus, uh, soil health and focus on plants and just how important they are um, in our system. And I think it's really also fitting that my initial um, adventure into the soil was actually through my journey of wanting to make my plants healthier. So I'd like to now hand over to Declan, who's going to explain a lot more further um, the, the science behind soil health and all that interaction of the biology. So Declan has over 30 years experience, um, experience in the agricultural industry and has worked in, uh, extensively through New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania, bringing the science of soil to land managers, urban designers, composters and engineers. Declan is now the principal science, soil scientist at Regen Soil prov and providing services in regenerative agriculture based um, out of Gippsland. Um, I'll now hand over to you, Declan, thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, and thanks for that very comprehensive introduction, Robin. Um, okay, you've got my screen. So, um, I'm just, we, we haven't got a, a whole lot of time today, so I'm going to do a little bit of a flyover that hopefully will provide some uh, context of the, the, the problem, uh, and I guess uh, framing up then for for Grant to talk about some of the solutions. So the first thing we have to think about is how do plants grow? And my answer to that, if I get my slide to move forward, is the same way that they've done since before the dinosaurs. And we have to realize that our management of agriculture is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, I mean, we've been farming for thousands of years, but uh, modern agriculture is indeed a modern phenomenon. So when we think about how plants grow, plants are the original primary producer. So they take uh, sunlight, uh, um, carbon dioxide, water, and through this magic of photosynthesis produce sugars, which are the building blocks for all life on earth. So the tops are for photosynthesis, the roots are about uh, accessing water and nutrients. But roots have a bit of a problem. Roots can only reach so far in the soil and they can only access so much of the soil's immense surface area. And more importantly, where even where the roots can access, the space between the soil particles is unreachable for the roots. And these spaces are called the micropores. And the micropores are where most of the water and minerals and nutrients are located in the, in the soil. So they're there but the plant roots, even the tiny root hairs, aren't able to access these tiny micropores. So plants needed to find a few friends. So who are these friends? Well, when we set about trying to figure out who these friends are, we do what we do as, uh, uh, in microbiology, and that is take some soil, put it on a Petri dish, and see what grows. And so we've got bacteria and fungi and we look at them under a microscope and we say, okay, that's what's in the soil. But then along came genomics. And this is where we're able to take a sample of soil and extract the DNA and the RNA from the soil. And what this has shown us is that there, the breadth of life in the soil was was uh, uh, incalculable and far, far more than we had ever thought was possible. And in fact, this whole new uh, group of archaea, we had never thought that they existed in soil at all. The archaea are referred to as extremophiles 
And we knew of them in places like sulfurous vents at the bottom of the ocean and hot springs and uh, salt lakes and other extreme environments like this. But 40% of what we thought were bacteria in the soil turn out to be archaea and they have critical roles to play in the soil in nutrient cycling. We also discovered that there is so much that we don't know. So this little image here shows the organism size. So for in vascular plants, we've described probably 88% of all plants on the planet. And as we go down in, in organism size to the bacteria, we've described less than 1.5% of all bacteria in the world. And very many of these are in the soil. So some of these special friends are bacteria and fungi. And this is a, an image showing mycorrhizal fungi colonizing a plant root. And these structures that you see are called arbuscles. And these basically impregnate the root and are allowed to impregnate the root by the plant that recognizes this foreign organism as a friend and uh, allows it to um, grow inside its own tissue uh, which is part of the special mutualism that these organisms have developed over these millions of years that they have been growing on Earth. And one of the reasons why mycorrhizal fungi are so incredibly important is because they can grow into the micropores that the plant roots can't reach. So we have the arbuscles that are connecting the mycorrhizal fungi with the plant root, and then the mycorrhizal fungi is extending out into the soil and colonizing all of these micropores and surfaces of soil particles where these nutrients and where water exists and, and uh, uh, increase the effective feeding and surface area of the roots uh, you know, by orders of magnitude. So this is how plants grow. And this is how plants have been growing for millions of years. And it's a very simple deal. The, uh, the plant provides sugars, glucose, energy to the underground organisms that aren't able to access this energy. This is their currency. This is their food, their gold. And in return, the soil organisms extend the root systems of plants uh, and work with the root systems of plants to extract minerals from the soil and to support water supply to the plant. But uh, so this is in summary. So we've got carbon dioxide, solar energy producing uh, organic matter. And this goes through into the soil food chain where we have these primary uh, shredders and soil engineers breaking the material up for the primary consumers, the fungi and the bacteria to cycle nutrients out to drive the whole system. And then along came Jones, as the old song uh, used to say. Um, and this is post Second World War really where the Green Revolution really took off and we discovered these incredibly powerful tools that we had at our disposal to grow plants. And we started feeding the plants uh, and uh, the, 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 the way that plants had previously been fed I guess it was just completely relegated to the side because it was so unimportant when we could put on these synthetic fertilizers and see such a profound response to them. Any thought of, uh, you know, supporting soil microorganisms was completely irrelevant in this context. And we grew huge crops. You know, the enormous successes of the Green Revolution, you know, staved off famine in India and allowed the world's population to grow you know, as exponentially as we have seen. But feeding the plants, we're now understanding, made the friends of the plants redundant, where at one time under organic inputs, we had thriving soil biology and thriving soil function. Um, under a system where we're using synthetic fertilizers, uh, these, these functions in the soil got turned off. And I'm, uh, the, the reference here on the side to this YouTube video is where all of these graphics have come from. And I urge you to have a look at that. It's the most elegant little video that um, I've seen in a long time. And it explains all this incredibly well. So the functions that get turned off in uh, a soil under synthetic uh, fertilizer use are things like phosphorus solubilization. And there are so many organisms in the soil. We think of mycorrhizal fungi as shown on the left here, uh, with, which is a micrograph of the arbuscle inside the plant root. 
And you can see that the amount of surface area on the arbustle is essential to that nutrient exchange with the plant. But also out in the rhizosphere, there are numerous bacteria that also have soluble phosphor, uh, soluble <laughs> phosphorus solubilizing uh, functions, and they all get turned off. And the reason they get turned off is because this, the plant is expending energy in return for the services that they provide. For example, with nitrogen fixation under a high nitrogen um, input environment, legumes, the legume has a, has a gene called the NIF gene, which is responsible for nodulation. The NIF gene gets turned off in the presence of very high nitrogen, which means the plant says, well, I don't have to expend energy making these nodules to house these rhizobia because I don't need them. I'm getting free nitrogen from somewhere else. The other thing that happened was that uh, with uh, the advent of modern agriculture is in, in moving to monocultures and you know, often small pastures or, or, or uh, shallow rooted uh, plants, the, the soil condition, which is what plants do by growing roots down and, and uh, maintaining the pore structure where they're following old dead root lines and worm channels and everything else, the things that ventilate and drain the soil, when those structures are not being serviced by deep roots, as on the left of this photograph, the soil structure effectively collapses. It's like a ruined mine shaft that uh, if it's not maintained, it will just gradually collapse in on itself. And when they collapse in on itself, there is the ventilation and drainage system in the deeper parts of the soil ceases to function. And so we're dealing with problems like water logging, shallow rooting, not able to access deeper water when, when, uh, when spring comes around and, and, and uh, failing crops as a result. Tilling the soil has an immense effect on, on soil microbial and, um, and arthropod populations. And this graph is taken from some work I did in Tassie um, uh, 10 years ago now. And it showed uh, it, the, uh, the, the uh, populations of arthropods per square meter in the soil range from 80,000 under a dryland pasture, which was an organic dairy farm, down to 5,000 on the most disturbed soil, potato random traffic. So we can see that there is a, a really strong relationship between arthropod populations and where you've got a lot of arthropods, you have similarly high populations of bacteria and fungi and soil disturbance. When we till the soil, we've lost carbon. And carbon, of course, is the lifeblood of the soil for so many reasons, not only for soil structure, but it's the currency of the soil. It's what drives microbial function. It's what drives arthropod function. And we have this precipitous loss in, in soil carbon when we first clear land. And our challenge now is to rebuild that soil carbon. The tragedy of all of this is it made us completely dependent on external inputs, because when we made all of these functions redundant in the soil, we had no choice but to use these powerful inputs. And so when we talk to so many growers now, there is only one way of growing plants, and that is apply fertilizer, plant grows. Don't apply fertilizer, plant doesn't grow. Have to apply fertilizer, have to apply pesticides and herbicides, you know, we, the soil science and the agricultural science community have, have taught people only one way to farm. So what we're learning now is there has to be a better way. So when we're talking about improving soil health with plants, it means regenerating soils. It means bringing nature back into uh, production systems and valuing the contribution that nature uh, provides and not working against nature. It means using our powerful tools more strategically. So it does not mean that we should stop using fertilizer. It does not mean that we should stop using herbicides or anything else in our arsenal that we need to use. But we have become so totally reliant on them that there is only one way to go. We see a pest, we get out the big guns. We see a weed, we bring out the big guns. Instead of saying, why is the weed there? Why is the pest there? And, you know, the expression that I love in, in terms of weed problems is, you know, particularly in pasture systems, do we have too many weeds or do we have not enough grass? And if we've got too many weeds, we haven't got enough grass. Why haven't we got enough grass? Because of the way we're managing our system. So let's think about the way we're managing our system rather than getting out there, treating the symptoms 
and just repeating, um, uh, repeating the same mistakes. We want to think about tuning the engine and the, the soil is the engine of, of production. Um, I, I'm not troubled by a chicken or egg situation about whether we need a healthy plant to make the soil healthy or we need a healthy soil to make the plant healthy. It all starts with the soil. You can have the healthiest, most vigorous plant in the world and if the soil is unhealthy, eventually the plant is going to run out of steam because it's going to be pushing the proverbial uphill against uh, um, a, a hostile soil. So when we talk about tuning the engine, we're talking about managing structure, we're talking about managing organic matter, we're, 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 we're increasing soil biological function, and the way we're doing that is with organic matter. We have very poor appreciation of the quantity, not, not, not alone the quality, but the quantity of organic matter that our soils need. Uh, as that graph from Chan showed, we have depleted our soils of so much carbon that the effort required to replace that carbon is really, really significant. And even where we're uh, uh, using best practice, for example, in a cropping situation where we're maintaining stubble, we're minimum tilling, work in Victoria over the, you know, 10 years ago showed that we're still not uh, um, uh, sequestering more carbon of those systems. At best, we're holding our own. In many systems, soil carbon is continuing to decline. Even using best practice in those situations is not enough to rebuild soil carbon. We've got to do more. A big focus on regenerative approaches is about reducing costs. You know, uh, as a product of the, of the, of the, the, the productive school of, um, of agriculture, you know, for years we were encouraging farmers to increase productivity because that's where, you know, the, there was greater profit without realizing that at a, we've, at a certain point we pass a sweet spot and additional productivity above that sweet spot we're paying for ourselves with the cost of our inputs. So with a focus on the cost of our operation, <clears throat> we're looking for that sweet spot of profitability um, by addressing uh, those high input costs that, um, that, that end up costing us more than, than rewarding us. Fundamentally, what we're trying to do in the context of climate change and the context of declining terms of, of uh, trade and, and feeling a loss of control over how much we're getting paid for a product, we've got to reduce risk for all of those reasons. And the only way the only way we can reduce risk is by increasing the capacity of our soils to hold water and to increase soil biological function. And we do that through maximizing biodiversity above and below ground and in maximizing biodiversity above and below ground, having a tremendous range of root architectures in the soil. This is how we're restoring the ventilation and drainage systems upon which our soils are so completely dependent. And the, uh, by restoring the ventilation and drainage systems, by increasing root depths in our uh, soils, that's how we are addressing risk, particularly from climate extreme, extremes and climate change. And if we can manage to do all of that, we're going to significantly reduce stress. We'll have lower debt, we'll have lower risk, we'll have less stress. I like, this is one of my favorite sayings at the moment. Um, so I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you, Declan, for that um, great um, overview of soil health. And that is a fantastic um, quote there. It really is this whole um, movement into Awakening of soil is really about opening our minds and keeping it um, open and out of the box of traditional agriculture. Um, so everyone, I'd just like to remind you if you could um, type some questions into um, the chat box and I'll be asking Declan and Grant at the end of these um, talks. So um, yeah, please add them in there and we'll um, yeah ask them at the end. So um, yeah, we'll now move on to Grant. So I've had the privilege of um, meeting Grant a number of times and speaking on stage. Grant is one super passionate person about soil. Um, he is a sixth generation farmer, farming um, in the 
northeast or middle north of Victoria near Echuca with his family and it's really exciting to see that his kids are really involved in farming. I think as we move forward it's really a, a lovely thing to have our kids involved and very important if we're going to have some future um, farmers that really care about our soil. Uh, he's a former president of Vic Notel and he's um, has recently started down under covers um, supplying um, cover crop seeds to people who want to move into this area. It just shows his passion of how he wants to make everybody. So Grant, I'll hand over to you and let you um, yeah, provide us some of the practical things that you're doing on your farm. Thank you. No worries. Um... Am I there? Uh, we haven't got your screen yet, Grant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that on or? Yeah, we've got that now. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, right. All right. So, so if yeah. you want to just start your slideshow or. Yeah, well, um, all right. Yeah, well, yeah well, that's my... I don't know how come my, um, my thing's not coming up. I'll get you a bit. Anyway, I'll just go straight into that then. Um, all right. Well, thanks. Thanks for having us uh, here um, for putting this on. Um, Phoebe and Upper Murray and, and Robin and Declan, that was that was awesome. Um, yeah, I'll just get straight into it then because we haven't got much time. So today I'll just, you know, Declan covered a lot of things off, you know, very well in a short amount of time. So I'll just talk about how we put some of these things into place to, to make that happen. And, and essentially this is what we're aiming for, to get good, you know, life into the soil worms and, and good crumb structure and aggregation. So um, I suppose if you, if you think about, um, on top of the ground, you look at something like a big tree and, and, you know, how much life they give above the ground, birds, ants, all those things. Well, what does that below the ground? It, it's essentially roots and it, and it all starts with the, the seed. Um, the sides or the commercial seed dressings anymore. And I reckon this is a really good place to start. Um, we make our own, uh, we've played around with a lot of different things, but I suppose at the end of the day, if we focus on getting minerals, microbes and carbon onto the seed, it sets it up to have a good um, a rhizosphere and, um, and get all those relationships happening. Because especially when we get into, and I'll talk about later, like the quorum sensing that we, happens with um, the diversity of roots, um, you know, all that happens through fungal association. So if you're putting some of these things on the seeds it's going to be detrimental for the first part of its life so what we want to see is that nice dreadlock happening around the root you know a greater root to shoot ratio um, a lot of these things we can you know there's commercial things out there we can buy on the market but a lot of these things i suppose it's about being more um you know uh economical you can make them yourself there's plenty of youtubes david johnson's bioreactor um you know, heaps of different things, you know, even just worm juice on the seed can have some really good effects. Um, we do things like trichoderma and pseudomonas um, as a bactar, bacillus, some of those things on there to help get those relationships and microbes really firing with the seed. Um, these are some examples. We've built our own uh, vermicast extractor, just a regenerative air blower that will blow through a bag of um, worm castings and, and knock all the microbes and, and minerals and things out and coat on the seed or inject it into the soil um, with liquid inject and, and can find that very, very cost effective um, and, and, and easy to do. Um, so some of the other things, I suppose, you know, 2008, we made a big change and, and stopped using uh, granular fertilizer. Um, we've played around, done trials and that, you know, and, and used it 
in transitioning new paddocks in, like weaning off and going onto a more biological liquid. Um, but yeah, we stopped with the map and seed dressings, fungicides, insecticides, and, and really got to focus on rotations and diversity. Um, I think on the map, you know, it's, I'm not saying don't use it, but if we are, we can be a bit more smart, make it more efficient, wrap it in a humate or a carbon source, stop it doing some of the, the you know, that negative burning for the mycorrhizae and things like that. But also, you know, um, I suppose as broad acre cropping, most of the time we're using MAP or urea. So, you know, if you look at what we're putting into the soil, NPK all the time and nitrogen, things like that, you know, we're removing crops every year, but are we replacing the moly? Are we replacing the zinc and the cobalt and things like that? All the different minerals, over 74 different minerals. So um, the liquids give us the ability to do that really well. We have a liquid system on our, um, on our cedar where we can inject, you know, a combination of minerals and microbes and carbon right into the seed zone and make sure we're um, really getting those plants functioning at, at their full capacity. Um, we now make our own. Um, we set up all these tanks. We're just setting up a shed now where we ferment um, like a bio-fermented liquid fertilizer. So very cost-effective and, and fun to do. So, you know, we might have a tank of moly, manganese, zinc, iron, so we can address all the different minerals and then we'll inject it into the soil. Um, what we're finding years ago when we we're just using the map and urea, we'd do, um, you know, you get all this really good early growth and, and vigor and, and some good biomass above the ground but we found our root systems were, were not massive. And um, when we did tissue and sap tests, we were always lacking copper, we we're lacking this and different, different minerals and trace elements. It's those um, things that are lacking, the different minerals and nutri nutrients that generally lead to then breakdowns in plant immunity to disease. You know, we, we, um, you have more disease pressures later, uh, insects, things like that. They're all symptoms generally to a lack of diversity and or nutritional um, things out of balance um, so with these liquids you know that we we use and make we're able to address a lot of those things we'll then tissue test throughout the year and um, and find that if anything's really lacking um, we can then foliar apply it you know using a fulvic to help chelate it and, and get it into the, the leaf and the plant very efficiently um, we'll measure and monitor that but we find by doing this you know, we, we, we measure bricks and I can talk about that a bit later, but by doing all this, it, it generally lifts our bricks, which is um, the plant's ability to photosynthesize. So the higher we have that um, working, you know, the more carbon we're pumping into the soil, carbon's the currency of the soil. So the more food we're pumping in there, feeding the microbes, the, the more it does it back to the plant in return and the less we have to do. So you see a lot of the time we've done trials with other um, forms and methods you know some of those other fertilizers can lock up in you know up to six to 12 weeks and then coming into grain filling in that critical time of the year you get rain you've got more disease pressure and the plants just can sometimes run out of nutrients and we, we can see this easily with um, tissue testing um, yeah not all this um, happens overnight like these are crops we had in a, in a very dry year that, um, you know, yielded very well, that um, it takes time to, to sort of build that biology and get that, that soil structure happening. Um, this was an interesting thing we observed in that, that dry year where we'd done trials with MAP and our biological liquids. Um, these photos were taken uh, late in the day and in, in really it was about 43 degrees heat. And you can see the flag leaf on the map completely curled up and pinched off, whereas the liquid crops were still, um, you know, photosynthesizing and functioning well. So um, part of that is having the mycorrhizal fungi and some of those things that Declan mentioned working um, creates, you know, they protect the plant from pathogens and, and a greater extension of the plant's roots. Um, you know, it's in, a, in good years then, if the lower inputs, you know, it's just about, it's not about um, cutting them out, it's just using them more efficiently. So wrapping them up with the carbon, foliar applying them so they get into the leaf and, and not getting locked up with other things within the soil. Um, you know, some of the things we focus on is, you know, to, to make all this happen, you know, essentially we need good soil and good soil structure to facilitate the biology. So we need it reasonably balanced. So these are some of the steps we take to, to help that happen. Um, these are examples of, you know, I think one of the most important things is eliminating or minimizing tillage. 
that tillage really creates that fine. You'll see the photo on the right from the tilled soil. Uh, that fine uh, breaks up the aggregates and creates that fine um, particles that then sieve down through the soil. And you can see it's dropping down the bottom of the vase there, um, which then forms that dense, hard, blocky layer. Once you have that um, sort of thing going on, very hard for roots to penetrate, um, very hard for water to infiltrate into those layers. And then, you know, no oxygen. If you've got no oxygen, nothing can live without oxygen or very little. Um, so that's another example, you know, later on, uh, the soil on the left is from one of our paddocks of this cedar for a number of years. Um, what we found when we pulled those clods of soil out of those vases, the one on the left actually dropped in volume of water because the the, the soil had absorbed it like a sponge. The other one had risen in water because half the soil was left behind. So these are good little um, things we can um, do to measure. Um, this is an example, you know, on the left and that redder soil is a new farm we had. That's what I'm talking about. The, the, that's the bottom of the, the shovel, that dense like a brick layer. So you get a summer rain now and we're trying to establish a, a summer crop or or any crop in the winter for that matter, you get the water that runs down, sits on that brick hard layer. You know, within the next two weeks, we've got 30, 40 degrees heat at the top. It's just evaporated and gone. Um, the one on the right and the bottom there, that's some of our soils where I've just turned the, you know, put the shovel in and turned it over. When you've got really crumbly aggregation like that, water can infiltrate in quicker, get down deeper. And once we can get it down below 30 centimetres or more, we can really protect it from, from evaporation in the sun. Because um, essentially, you know, it's either going to, we're either going to use it up with the plant transpiring it out where we can make money or it runs off or evaporates. And you can only make money doing it with the first way. Um, so how can we measure when things are improving? Um, these are great tools, the penetrometer. Um, it's got a little gauge on it that measures the the sort of the pressure of the of the soil detects hard pans and and you know can uh, moisture content so you push that in you know um, you see that needle go around and I see it quite a bit a lot of soils you get it down about two feet and then that's it even in the middle of winter um, we find with controlled traffic and and zero or minimum tillage uh, over you know time it just gets better and better we can push that probe down further and further. Um, which then gives us greater infiltration and water holding capacity. So they're a great tool to, to use to measure that. Okay, so this is how we, if we want to improve our subsoil structure um, without tillage, um, you know, it, it comes as I've seen a graph, you know, how fast you want to get there, how much money you want to spend. But, um, you know, you potentially could come in and rip it once, but then you can, you can create a lot of problems by doing that. It's about getting the roots in and these little things, the worms, the dung beetles, they'll go do a lot of the work. You know, they can go down far deeper than any implement you can put into the soil can. And they're also, you know, turning soil over, creating more nutrients, things like that. The other way we can do it is through, uh, through roots. Um, these plants, there's a number of ones, tap rooted, deep rooted plants, like Declan said, a lot of the winter, you know, especially in our cropping, we focus on uh, a lot of winter stuff. Um, probably out of that, the only one really is the canolas and things that have the, the really big, good, good tap roots. Um, so we, with our cover crops or multi-species forages, you know, we can get these radishes in, um, sunflowers, safflower, some of the sorghums, they're a powerful big root and they can get down really deep into the soil and, and create really good structure and break it up. The other thing some of these uh, plants can do is, um, you know, Radishes, this is they, they, those tubers that you see, they fill up, they, they're filling, they'll go down into the subsoil and scavenge nutrients and bring up uh, and accumulate them and redeposit re them into the topsoil. Also great feed for livestock, um, things like that. Um, so yeah, when we, the other thing I'll talk about is keeping the soil covered. So this is where it's very hard to um, do these sort of things, sowing into you know, green crops or into big heavy stubbles. This cedar we use, um, there's a number of them out there. If you set them up well, you can pretty well soak it through anything, really heavy stubbles and, um, and which, you know, this is what we're trying to achieve. A good ground cover helps for weed suppression, um, temperature regulation, um, and just sort of protects the soil from, from the elements. And 
also a food source for the animals um, or the worms and things. Um, diversity and rotations. I'm just sort of going to skip through some of these things um, pretty quick, but these are examples where um, we see the power of diversity in the roots. So uh, on the left is a canola. This is on very sodic clay um, that, you know, sets hard in the summer when it's dry and, and gets very wet and saturated when it's wet um, with all the so excess sodium. So we put canola and, and stuff in there and, and it come in real wet. You know, this is on the left, had $100 a hectare of fertilizer and whatever, $50 a hectare on seed. On the right, that's um, straight through a fence, next paddock, think about $40 a hectare in seed. Um, that was a 13 way mix that we do. Um, and we just used the worm extract, I think under that one. So no, no fertilizer, but I'm not, not saying don't use fertilizer with them, but um, we find once we get this system soil structure and the diversity of roots going for a number of years and biology happening, it's really amazing what you can achieve. Um, we got a huge amount of biomass. We find with these multi-species covers, um, or forage crops or whatever you want to call them. Um, we don't have to grow them all after the summer, after the header. That's, a, I find, in our environment, fairly opportunistic and, and a lot uh, can be tricky because, you know, you get a rain and then you get a couple of weeks of hot, dry weather. It can be a little bit harder to, to establish, but planting these into the autumn, um, you know, as a, as a break crop through our rotation, you know, we get really good weed control later on in the year. Uh, really good nutrient cycling and, and, you know, we have nitrogen fixes in there, phosphorus solubilizers, things that inoculate the soil. We still harvest these crops with a four-legged harvester and convert that biomass into live weight gains, which is actually less nutrient removal because most of it's returned back through the other end into a more digestible form through the animal. Um, so how does all this work? Um, you know, a diversity of root structures, we become far more nutrient and water efficient because we can explore greater areas of soil with different, um, you know, architecture of roots. Um, if we all have the one plant, a monoculture, that root system's all exploring the same area of the soil, same, looking for the same moisture and nutrients at the same time. Through this way, we can explore larger areas and then through fungal associations or quorum sensing, they can they actually can share. Now there are certain plants that can be uh, antagonistic or, or uh, detrimental that to each other, like allopathic and certain things. But that's why we carefully make sure we design ones that can be positive and they can have different pHs around the root zone, making more minerals, different ones available, and then sharing with each other. Um, so the first time I really saw this evident that blew me away was where we'd thrown some buckwheat just in a small strip there, um, as where the boys are doing the buckwheat angels. Um, you know, we had half a foot of biomass increase there and all the other species in that, that area, just from that buckwheat. Um, now buckwheats are really good at solubilizing phosphorus. Um, so obviously that's pretty important for root growth and, and early, early um, vigor. Um, so we saw, yeah, and then that frosted out in the winter, but we still had the, the greater biomass. Um, other things like um, Declan was saying about the, the, the legumes and the things fixing nitrogen. Now, if they're in a, in a paddock that's had a high history of urea or, or animal, you know, high nitrogen levels in the soil, um, we find a lot less nodules. You plant those legumes next to scavengers like wheat, ryegrass, radishes, all those things are scavengers for N. They can, you know, make those um, legumes fix up to twice the amount of nitrogen. Also, you know, things like clovers and that can, um, their root exudates are like sulfuric acid, they, which is used to break that calcium phosphorus bond. Um, so so some of, there's a lot of things going on in there, not just nitrogen fixing these roots are feeding carbon into the soil and, 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 um, and releasing other minerals and nutrients as well. Um, so, you know, this is one way we can reduce our, um, our urea or nitrogen inputs is by planting uh, legumes with our crops. Um, you know, legumes, uh, we can then, you know, if it's with a wheat, something like that, these are beans, we can spray them out with a broadleaf spray later on just before flag leaf quite, quite effectively or we can you know, harvest the two together and separate them. We do a lot of this, especially with canolas. We never plant canola 
as, as a monoculture anymore. Um, another good one we're using for that is like lentils, um, things that are, are low water users and but they're still sitting there um, tipping in nitrogen and feeding carbon, adding that bit of diversity, but they're never going to be the boss and rob um, water and moisture from the canola at the critical time because it's a tap-rooted plant. So it'll always fill and, and win out in the end. Um, I'll just be mindful of the time here, but um, quickly dissolving urea. Um, we'll dissolve it in a big tank like this. We'll put seven ton in a, say 30,000 or 28,000 litre tank. Um, we suck it out the bottom um, for the first bit or just a foot off the bottom so we don't suck the urea into the pump. Get the tank spinning, might take us, you know, to do that amount, um, half a day. Um, then we'll apply that with um, some humic or some fulvic carbon to buffer it and magnify it. And then it's a good opportunity. We can do our broadleaf sprays with this. So you, you're being more efficient with, you know, chuck a bit in as you're going over the paddock and or um, you know, add some other minerals that are lacking in biology like fish and worm and kelp and things like that. And we always, when we do anything like this, we'll measure the bricks of the plant um, before and after, whether it be a, a, you know, a nutrition type application or, or a herbicide. And, and what we want to see is that bricks level going up, not down. Um, you know, if we are going to use MAP, um, add the soluble humates to it. Um, be careful, this was a, a real uh, cock up here because uh, we put a little bit too much on. So be mindful of how much you can put on how many liters per ton, um, but that can really help. Uh, these are, yeah, some trials we did with MAP versus some of the liquids. I suppose if you are changing from that to a more, you know, a slow release or a biological liquid, it's been, um, mindful of things you know they'll in the winter when it's colder and and so things like that you get a lot more growth and a lot more soluble nutrition up front with those other fertilizers so they they can you know um give you a lot more biomass at the start but then when we find we get into the uh, spring as you can see on the right they stay greener longer and they catch up and then you're still in the game if you get late rains and things um i probably don't know how much time i've got left here so i might um well, these are some of the foliar sprays we, we've made up with the um, vermicast extract um, in, in ver worm, worm juice or worm castings. There's a thing called Pseudomonas florensis, and that feeds on Pseudomonas syringae, which is um, what causes uh, um, ice nu nucleating bacteria that can give you frost damage. So, you know, this is very cheap and easy to do helps detoxify and break down chemicals. But if we can put this on with some dissolved urea and nutrition, costs us not much, but you know, this is what I'm told. And if, you know, can protect the plant for up to two months down to minus six degrees. So I think it's a no brainer, put that in, doesn't cost much. It can only, only benefit um, if half of that's true, it's pretty awesome. Um, Brent, you've still got um, 10 minutes if you need, eight minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks Robin. Um, all right, so I'll just talk a little bit on um, insects and things, how we manage them. Um, this is Dr. Lundgren, Jonathan Lundgren from South Dakota, Blue Dasher Farms. Um, so insects are very important. I don't know how much we, we're always looking at them as a negative. You know, we're looking at aphids or red legs or army worm. And, but some of those things we've got to start looking at, well, their indicators are something's out of whack. They're trying to sort things out. Um, there's a lot of good things we, we've done. We did insect traps with um, Dr. Lundgren there uh, in that that was a cover crop. We did some in our grain crops as well. And we found, you know, we set these traps overnight. We came out the next day. We had over 43 different species of insects and very little pests among that. We're finding now after years of not using the insecticides and, and getting more diversity and things in, you know, we're getting spiders, all these little beetles, all these things that feed on you know, just cycling nutrients and feeding on the pests and things like that. Um, a lot of the time, um, um, you know, these pests, we hit them with an insecticide. They're generally the first thing that comes back. You're knocking out all your predators. So we're going to be mindful of that. Um, is there some situations, you know, it's about knowing your thresholds. If you are getting absolutely hammered, at the end of the day, we don't want to lose a crop. But if we can, we find if we can get our bricks level up, we might put a bit of liquid calcium 
some other biological stimulants on, improve the health of the plant, get it photosynthesizing better, then all of a sudden those insects move away. A lot of them generally try um, come into crops that are high in nitrates and low in sugars. And that's generally what happens when you juice them up with a heap of urea. So I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm just saying be mindful. There's other ways, like I was saying, dissolving it. We can get it in more efficiently into the plant um, and then lift the sugars and, and lower the nitrates and still have that plant functioning. Um, this was, yeah, we had these Portuguese millipedes in a lentil crop. Um, you know, I was a bit worried there for, for a minute because they can be um, detrimental to that, but we had that many other things going on in there. We didn't, we just sat back and, and, and didn't do anything. We we're watching it, monitoring it closely, but um, yeah, we didn't seem to have any lentils um, lost and um, it all just sort of worked out in the end. Um, another, yeah, these are sort of examples why, you know, different spiders, ants and things eating the wire worm, little bugs feeding on eggs, slug eggs and things. So this is what we need to do, start uh, building up, you know, creating habitat and building up these predators. Um, you know, I suppose going forward, um, people are more mindful of what we do to when we're growing our crops because at the end of the day, we're not just growing commodities, we are growing food. So we've got to think about that when, when we're doing some of these things to the crops we're growing. Um, some of these uh, insecticides and fungicides are getting either banned or and or fully resistant to all these pests and it's happening all around the place, I see it. So I think uh, if these things aren't working, you know, if we're out here every year putting an insecticide or fungicide on, we're not really treating or doing anything. All we're doing is we're not solving anything. We're just treating symptoms. So let's look at why this has happened. And a lot of times it's a lack of nutrients, minerals. Like I said, we focus on MPK with MAP and urea. But are we getting enough manganese? And are we getting enough moly or zinc and all these things? So we need to look at that. Um, these are other examples of, um, I think it was loose and flea. Um, hitting the um, faber bean crop pretty hard. Uh, they were giving it a real hiding and I was, you know, thinking, geez, what are we gonna have to do here? We went out with a um, liquid calcium, um, some other biological stimulants to try and pick the plant, you know, kelp and fish and some of those things, pick the plant's immune system up, make it start defending itself. That's a crop of beans we had on irrigation. I think it went about four ton, didn't do one fungicide or one insecticide. And uh, it was very clean. That was the same crop that I had the photo earlier where we were getting absolute smash. So what we find, liquid calcium for us is, is really very good in foliars because we're heavy clays and generally calcium is fairly immobile into the plant. So we can get that, get that up, helps lift the sugars. Um, and then, you know, the plants photosynthesize and higher. You know, I've, I've read once the plants photosynthesize at the bricks of 12, they become largely resistant to insects. Once it hits 14 and above, they hardly even want to land on the plant. And you've got the antennas that they can sort of measure these things. And so that's what I uh, hear what we're talking about. Um, the other thing with the bricks is it's not only just for less, you know, better health, health plant and nutrient density, but uh, it changes your freezing point. So um, you put something in the fridge with high sugar, it takes longer to freeze. So that's a bonus. Also, um, for you know, everyone knows cutting loose and for hay with a higher bricks late in the afternoon, you get greater, more energy in your hay. So it's no different to an animal grazing that, uh, whether it be a dairy cow, beef, or sheep or lamb. Um, we're finding um, amazing weight gains now, where we're getting our bricks up high and we've got diversity of plants because you know, the, as you say there. A one percent lifting bricks can have some really solid um, weight gain effects and/or milk production on that. Um, some of the other things we do is control traffic, so we we get our um, confine that to about eleven percent of the paddock, so um, we don't drive all over it. So that helps with the soil getting um, softer and better infiltration. Um, the controlled traffic, we can do some chaff lining and catch the weed seeds, put it into a little narrow windrow. So we're confining them to a small area that we can control easier later. Um, now, a lot of guys are doing this and putting them through a seed destructor, destructor instead of spreading them back all over the paddock, which then you know, cuts down some of your herbicide use, which is good. Um, you know, the cattle, this is how we do controlled traffic cattle farming. Um, that's this, that's not, that's a friend's photo. Um, this is actually ours. We still haven't got them trained up 
quite right yet. They sort of wander off a bit. But um, what we do find when we're back grazing the cattle on our, our cropping paddocks, we're very mindful um, with them with compaction. So uh, over the winter and, and stuff like that, um, we move them very regularly, like every two or three days. And what we find is when we, we can split a massive big paddock in half with a steel wire and then run poly wires off that back grazing it, when they go back to water, that's most of the time when the damage is done, but we actually set the poly wires up so they're walking back to water on the way the tram lines are. And they actually do walk over to the tram line and walk back along them back to the water. So it kind of works pretty well. They like walking on, the, on a firm surface when they're, when they're going back to get water or, or the hay feeders or whatever. Um, so, you know, it's the soil compaction from livestock is just a, a symptom of density and time. So if we let them wander around, set stock in a huge paddock for three months, they're going to do a lot more damage than if they're on two hectares for four days, then they're off and gone. So the, um, through the winter, especially that, that strip grazing or mob grazing, very important. Um, and then it's about that nutrient cycling we have, you know, we'll run them on our stripper stubbles. We're finding we've, We've um, done fodder feed tests on the stripper stubble because all we're removing with that front is the grain. So we've got the flag leaf, a really good energy and protein in there for them still. These cows, then it's about, you know, using these animals to balance that carbon to nitrogen ratio and also prime the soil with their biology out of their gut because they're essentially just a walking composting machine. So we can, you know, go and make all these compost teas and all this sort of stuff, or we can use an animal that does it for you and walks around and spreads it for you. And you're making money what using these animals growing them out. Um, we measure this, um, you know, in the in our harvesters, we've got yield monitors, so we can measure everything we're doing, track what our performance, you know, uh, water use efficiencies to how much rain and how much grain we can produce. Um, no different with the livestock. We use um, scales in the crush and measure their live weight gains on the different um, things we're doing. So, um, and we can do dry matter cuts in these forage crops, you know, work out for say six ton of dry matter, how much live weight we put on um, per that. And when we do the numbers on that, we're finding them very, very good. Um, very low cost and very high output because well, I suppose at the moment we're pretty lucky with the, the livestock jobs really strong but um yeah they're very very good tool these animals to to regenerating the soil now and this is a, a homemade what we made up to to uh, shift the cattle along with the poly wire um we I'll usually wait till the kids get off the bus after school and get them on help out um but that's a good time late in the day, your plants are bricks and higher to set them into a new pasture. Um, we find, you know, this is another thing we've done with the strip grazing. So a way we can manage our weed seed set without using herbicides where we might grow a multi-species forage or cover crop up um, to around this time, or well, probably October or so when you'd be cutting hay, we might drop that on the ground um, and then swath graze the windrows the good thing about this is, is less bailing costs, a lot less tractor, you know, traffic on your paddock. You're in there the day you're cutting with these animals, but and then if you do get any reshoots of ryegrass or anything like that, they seem to just nip it off real quick. But this is what we generally see with our cattle most of the time. They're just laying around because it doesn't take them long to get uh, full gut when they're eating diversity and, and, and minerally balanced um, crops. So I might uh, wrap it up there. Um, so we've got time for questions and that, mindful of, of the time. But um, yeah, I'll throw it back to, to you, Robin, and thanks for that. Thanks very much, Grant. That was perfect timing. Yeah. Um, so now I'd just like to um, open it up to some questions to you and Declan, if that's okay. Um, so we've got a number here in our chat box and I've just sort of um, categorised them um, and just ask you some general questions. So one of the, I suppose, one of the questions that's coming up is really, what is some advice um, that you would give to people that are just starting out um, on this process? So um, questions come around like with very compacted soil and also in um, areas where you've got low rainfall and wanting to grow cover crops. So open to you and Declan, uh, Grant and you. Yep. Um, yep, well, I suppose, like I said, it takes time and, and it probably takes longer when you are in a, are you getting me now? Yeah, yeah, we got you. Yep. 
Yeah, it does take longer when you're in a lower rainfall, we find, you know, on irrigation, you can speed it up real quick. So probably being, you know, um, realistic and giving yourself a little bit more time, three to five years. Um, I suppose one way we can wind back uh, fertilizers without being detrimental to yield is, you know, wrapping them in that carbon source, that humate, making them more efficient. So you might be able to wind them back 25% and then maybe 50%. And then instead of putting everything all up front, you know, some of that savings you make from winding them back at sowing, which I think is a good way to, you, um, you, then, you know, you've got the foliage you can come in later. Now those foliage will work probably more effectively in a, in a better structured um, soil. So if you have got compacted soils, being mindful of that and, and probably know, look at what is causing that compaction. Is it, um, is it excess traffic, excess tillage? So they're things we need to stop. Get more tap-rooted plants into there to help break it up. And, and those soils generally will have, you know, weeds that'll be your thistles or those tap-rooted plants. So look at them as indicators and go, okay, that's a weed that's grown here. It's trying to fix the soil. Now let's get a plant that is very similar to that weed that we can make money from and fix the soil instead of, a weed that you can't make money from. Um, so, you know, working that out. Also look at calcium levels because calcium can flocculate the soil and a lot of these compacted clays are just, we need to get that calcium in there and start opening it up a bit. Um, so yeah, Declan, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things to that. When we, you mentioned some principles of, um, uh, principles of, uh, <coughs> regenerating soil and I think the the hierarchy of them is that the first thing we've got to do is try and uh, address uh, uh, ground cover um, if we can minimize if we can minimize bare soil maximize ground cover we're setting the system up to capture as much carbon as possible and to put as much carbon as possible into the soil we're also protecting the surface of the soil and the top centimeter or two of the soil is the most fertile and biologically active layer in the entire soil. That's the section that gets blown away uh, when it's bare or gets solarized when it's bare by the sun. So the second um, uh, uh, strategy is really about trying to keep something living year round as much as possible. And some of the things that Grant talked about, you know, in particular in our heavy soils, we talk about um, needing to lift calcium. And there's a lot of debate in the soil sciences, uh, you know, circles around calcium magnesium ratios. But for me, because we understand that calcium is a really significant flocculator in the soil, after organic matter, it's the most important flocculator in the soil. And it's, uh, uh, you know, about six times more powerful than the next, uh, uh, than the next most powerful flocculator, which is magnesium, which is not particularly strong. So the more calcium we have, particularly in a heavy soil, the better that soil is going to be structured. So a lot of the time we're dealing with these problems of tight soils uh, because of chemical imbalances it might be natural, but if we're trying to grow improved crops or, or um, commercial crops, we, we do have to change the soil to make it more amenable to suit those. If we've got tight soil, there's always a, 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 a or compacted soil, there's always a desire to rush in there with a ripper and rip it up. And that feels good. But if you don't change your practice after doing that, it's just going to revert back. And within a couple of years, you'll be back at square one again. So rip only if you've got a backup plan. If you say, I'm ripping because I want to grow more deep rooted crops or because I'm going to increase my ground cover. Thank you for that, um, Declan. So um, next question um, is around water cycles um, and directed to you, Declan, um, how healthy soils and healthy plants can influence our water cycles. Do you have um, thoughts on that? And can you point um, people into the direction of any scientific studies that have been done in this area? Okay, so that's, so there's a lot of interest now in what's, what we term the, the, the small water cycle. And the small water cycle is about the water that is essentially held close to the ground. Um, we have kind of, we've destroyed the small water cycle in, in pastures that we graze to within, you know, just a few inches or, or less. 
any moisture that comes out of the soil and into the plant is going to be evaporated off immediately. And any moisture that's near the surface of the soil is going to be evaporated off really quickly. When we, when we grow large crops and when we maintain high residuals in our grazing paddocks, we're maintaining uh, higher levels of humidity closer to the ground. And that's really what we're trying to do with the soil with the small water cycle. We're, we want to attract more dew. The, the plants, will, even in dry conditions, plants will take up water through their leaves. Um, we'll encourage some of that dew to run down to the crown of the plant where some of the plant roots will take it up. In other words, it's being captured in the system instead of being immediately lost to the system. I'm not aware of research that's looked at the small uh, water cycle um, uh, uh, per se, although I'm sure it's there. I'm just, I can't direct, uh, direct you to them uh, straight away. Grant, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, well, it's something, um, it's sort of, I know it's water cycle or helping uh, infiltration and, and growth, but it was an accidental kind of trial I did last year that I observed where we'd had a big paddock and it was a, it was actually a dry land um, loosen that we over sowed with the 13 way mix. And we split it in half with a steel wire and then poly grazed or back grazed one half of it through the year, through the winter with all these heifers while the crop was growing. So, um, you know, being mindful not to graze everything off. So grazing management important, but you know, each time you're grazing, you are pruning those roots. The other half we just let go because, and then by the time we got to that half, it was sort of late in the year, October, and it was pretty well milky dough, nearly when you'd cut it for hay. We pulled that wire down and, and let the animals into there and then they just smash graze that. And it's something I suppose you see, you don't see it quite often done that way. Um, a lot of times with our animals, we're always, we're not banking much feed. We're always grazing what we've got always as it's growing. So when we did it that other way, um, this year we come back into that paddock and oversowed it again. The half we grazed late in the year, which let the plants get up to their full, nearly maturity, which was, um, was sort of milky dough when we did it. We had nearly double the biomass the following year on that side versus the side we grazed while the crop's growing. And it was really interesting and it really, it actually changed our management this year where we just, instead of putting them on a paddock while it's growing, kept paddocks aside and let them get up as big as we could and then crash graze it. And, and I think a number of things, you know, we're getting a bigger plant, we're getting root, bigger root systems down deeper area of the soil. So creating more, you know, um, aggregation and infiltration paths, but bringing up more minerals and nutrients. And then that smash grazing gives that mulching effect, which like Declan says, keeps that ground cover more, more of that ground cover on there to help protect, you know, the soil. So, um, yeah, it's something and I know for us in this environment, you know, from October through to, you know, that six months over the summer, generally you're not growing much. So then you either got to be feeding hay or, man, you know, how you manage your animals, but banking feed like that, I think is another effective way to improve our soil and help feed livestock over the summer. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. Um, so the next question probably links to our intensive cropping rotation in um, Tassie. Um, have either of you come across any new research that's happening in that area? Um, and because we're probably high rainfall area, um, and I, it's a question for all around the world, slugs and snails become a problem when we've got that whole high mulch layer. Um, do you have any... Um, observations in this area um, or is it in my thinking maybe do we have to just get our plants healthier so the slugs and snails don't want to be eating them sorry it's a big question <laughs> um yeah well I, I, we, we haven't had that problem here and we're probably not high enough rainfall and and stuff to get that maybe um so we, we haven't had to deal with it, but I have heard in places, um, one of the things that can feed on like slug eggs is protozoa. They can suck the amino acids and things out, out of the, uh, the slug egg. Now I've, I have heard in areas where um, a lot of these things first started happening was on the introduction of, of certain um, fungicides or seed dressings, which then suppressed or killed the protozoa in the soil. So you know this is all just stuff i've heard and observations but um it's sort of being mindful of some of the 
I know Dr. Lundgren told me with the insect, with human population, most of our viruses and diseases are bacterial based, but in the insect population, they're fungal based. So by putting a fungicide on, you wipe out all the things that keep their, um, you know, the, the, them in check, I suppose. Um, and then obviously running straight blanket insecticides on, you're taking out all the predators. So they're probably two, two forms of sides or chemicals that I was to, told very early in the piece to, if we can eliminate or minimize them, we start to encourage beneficial fungi and other things like protozoa that can thrive in soils with, they don't have an, an overuse of those things and also the insecticides. We need to get more predators, spiders and things in and, and, and that can be hard. Um, you, there might be a, a transition stage where you're gonna have to take a bit of pain and, and, and to, to build that. Um, you know, one way is you can just do boundary sprays to try and stop and just leave some areas where you've got your beneficials can then build off from that. But um, yeah, I think that they're two chemicals that we've got to be mindful of, of overusing. <laughs> Yeah, and the, I mean, the other thing is also um, not just putting our monocultures into that um, mulch layer, um, try and have a bit of diversity so your slugs have got other things to be eating. Um, but it's just a question that everyone throws at, to me, at me and a lot around the world when I was travelling. But what do you do about slugs and snails? But I think there's, as you said, there are things we can be doing and it is about, um, yeah, just getting our ecosystem of the soil working. The, the other yeah. thing, oh, sorry, just I'll just jump in quickly. Like, um, you know, obviously birds like um, will, will be very good, chickens and that. And, I mean, you're not going to go and run chickens on an 8,000-acre farm. But the quail, like we have a lot of quail now because we run the strip of front, have a lot of stubble, we keep cover. We're finding, and I'd be careful how I say this because we don't want a heap of quail shooters rocking <laughs> up. Like we've banned them now because I want those quail there running around like little chickens, you know, picking up weed seeds, picking up any little bugs and grubs. So we can get that diversity or keep that cover on. We start bringing in, in other birds, life like that can help with some of these problems. Yeah, so it's that holistic approach to farming, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I was going to say that uh, in, in, um, in cropping, it's, it's, a, it's a particular challenge because, uh, and you, you made the point, Robin, because of the, the narrow... Um, <clears throat> diversity that we have in, in crop. I mean, you know, they're basically monocrops. So our challenge is to get more diversity into those. And, and uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I would like to see, for example, up in, um, up in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the cropping uh, regions in Victoria is using the like of medic uh, underneath the, the, the cereal crop, not only for nitrogen fixation, but just to have you know, we're, we're automatically, just by putting one more plant in there, we're, we're, in, we're doubling the, um, uh, the diversity in that, in that environment. Uh, you know, we want things like beetles in there. Beetles are, going, are a good uh, control for slug eggs. Uh, so we're not going to get that until we start getting that diversity back in there. The other thing that the Americans have been doing a bit of is, um, is with their intercropping, they're, they're planting... Um, companion crops in, in strips, cash crops in strips across the paddock. And anything that we can do to increase the diversity in the paddock to attract in or provide habitat for beneficials is going to help deal with some of these intractable problems. We, um, I'll jump in there. We did one, and I think you, this is where you're limited by your imagination, how you can go about and do that. And this year we did a lot, because um, we had that early good start, it was a good opportunity to get some I suppose in our, a lot of our cropping soils here, we, the, a lot of diversity we lack is summer species. We never seem to, we're always growing wheat, canola, like cool season stuff. And so we went out with our wheat crops and sowed buckwheat and things like that, that will get very fast, rapid growth in, in early autumn, but then they frost out very easy. So we don't have to then go out and spray them out or get rid of them later. They naturally just frost out. And, um, you know, I did one on Twitter, like we had buckwheat with some canola or, or wheat or something like that, you know, for, to release that phosphorus. But I got a comment back that, that those plants can attract parasitic wasps. They're pollinating plants that, that feed on aphids. And, and it's about having, like you say, that the diversity in there to bring in those wasps and those uh, other things that will prey on some of our pests. And then all of a sudden they frost out bang, you got your, but you've got that little bit of diversity in for a couple of months um, very effectively without 
being detrimental at Grainfield and things on the other end of the season. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, that diversity is just absolutely key, isn't it? And also thinking outside the box of how we've traditionally been doing our farming to, to try and get that diversity in and also make things work for us down the, like, I mean, there's a potential of having maybe two crops off one paddock by um, thinking differently, having buckwheat over the top of your wheat, your winter wheat or something along those lines. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, just a, one sort of quick question. When we're putting um, cover crops together, how important do you think it is to have um, the four different groups of families or the five different groups of families that Graham Say talks about? So our legumes, brassicas, grasses, um, cereals, and chenopods. Do you want to go yeah, the chenopod one is an interesting one. And I've encouraged uh, a couple of my um, uh, clients to uh, have a go with that. Uh, you know, Graham talks about in including the chenopods. And the chenopods are some of uh, the beet family, you know, things like uh, silver beet or, or um, um, Quinoa. even beetroot. Yeah, and uh, he says you only need it at one or two percent in the mix, so at fairly low proportion, but it seems to make a significant difference. I can't really understand why the addition of that fifth uh, family should make such a big difference, but I'm willing to have a look and see. Yeah. Um, we're, we're currently trialling some of this at the moment, because obviously with our um, down under covers stuff we're doing but um, I talk to we get sort of collaborate and work with a few um, in the states on all this and and part of it is like you, the more the merrier in a way but there can be a point where you're just throwing things in and they're just not going to do much anyway so then are we adding value if we're spending money on seed that's not going to do anything and and some of those shenopods the beets and that are very very expensive like $350 a kilo time type of thing and I've been told like some of them in a uh, in high divert, they're not very competitive. They're a very small seed. Um, so in a high diverse thing, they may not do much anyway. Um, but there's one we're looking at that I think could be a, a winner for that. And it's the, the quinoa. We've actually got some in now trialing it with and without it. Um, it's, a, it's a bit more like canola. So it, it, um, I'm told will be a bit more competitive and, and the seeds a lot more affordable than some of those small seed beets and things. So that's one we're looking at closely at the moment. Um, but definitely we find, you know, getting a, a little bit from each group um, when we're building them, we sort of put a higher ratio of certain ones that we know are going to do a lot of heavy lifting and provide, you know, good grazing value and things. And then just getting those other bits and pieces in. And, and the thing that amazes me is sometimes you might have a, a you know, a heavy clay soil that mightn't be very good for things like lupins that grow better in the lighter sands or, or sodic soils or beans and things like that, you put them in a monoculture through the fence and they might grow a foot high and no good. I'll put them in a highly diverse mix and next thing they're up over your waist. It's, it really is incredible the magic that can happen um, if you get that diversity in there. So I definitely think it's important to have as much of that as, in as you can. Um, and yeah, the Shenopod one is something we're working on now just to, because we, you know, we want to make sure it's going to give value if we're going to use it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's an interesting one to contemplate. Um, yeah, so look, I think we should um, wrap it up here. We've gone past time. Um, I'd just like to um, thank you both um, for, for taking your time to um, yeah, spread your knowledge about what you've done, been doing on your farms and what you've been seeing around, around the world and around um, Australia. So I'd um, like to thank um, the Soil CRC, um, the Upper Hopkins Land Management Group, the Holbrook Land, Group, um, Land Care Network, and obviously Declan at Regen Soils and Down Under Covers um, with um, Grant up in Echuca. So um, is there anything else that um, Asher and Phoebe you would like to add to this webinar before we close off. Um, and also I'd, I'd just like to say, if anyone does have questions, please get in touch with any of us. Um, we're more than happy to um, answer questions. Um, we're all very passionate and making, about making farming better for our soil. So please get in contact. Asher and Phoebe. Thanks Robin. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Phoebe. 
Uh, yeah, just thanks everyone for coming. Um, just a quick wrap up. Um, if you want to know any more information um, about the SOL CRC and their projects, we've got a couple of links here that we're going to send out that um, they've got some projects running on a similar theme as today's um, workshop. But yeah, thank you very much for their support and thank you very much Declan, Grant and Robin for uh, putting on a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you everyone and thank you Phoebe for being a great partner in this Soil CRC project. <laughs> yes, thanks to you too Aisha, it's been great. <laughs> okay, have a good morning everyone. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thank you.